So here we've got five um, successful entrepreneurs from uh, our community I mean, who's volunteered to come in and give their wisdom and their experiences with running a business from um, uh, being a, a consultant, uh, hopefully from being a consultant to, uh, to running a successful business. So people sitting here uh, don't need any introduction, but for people who are new to the community, I mean, I'd like to go through um, each. I mean, so I'll go as it appears on my screen. So Sam is on top. So Sam um, runs a, a teaching and consultancy business if, and uh, he sticks to engineering principles and, uh, and is an advocate of unit team and uh, following software principles. And uh, if you don't follow his blog, you should do. Okay, next on my screen is John. Uh, uh, John runs Boulder Software, has many employees and uh, has run a successful business for over a decade or so now. Uh, he has a presentation coming up with about system link and test and uh, uh, later in this uh, event. And um, uh, he has built up a software business right from scratch uh, now to a really successful um, business. Uh, next is Steve Watts. He doesn't need any introduction, uh, but I guess um, when I started off using LabVIEW, it was more of a tool and it's only after I sort of read his book or uh, I also had the privilege of sort of working with his code at some point in the end that I made the transition of making it from a tool to a, a bona fide you know, programming language. I don't know if that makes any sense. I mean, but the thing is, I mean, that's the first time I started looking at LabVIEW as an engineering uh, or, or, or as a software en uh, engineering tool than, uh, than, than just a utility of a tool that you know, gets me from A to B. Uh, next is uh, Ram. Ram uh, runs a teaching and consultancy business again. I mean, and uh, he's uh, based in India uh, and Nepal. And uh, he mentors and uh, teaches, uh, does classes and courses. Uh, which um, allows people to certify CLAs, uh, CTA, that kind of thing. Steen, uh, Steen is based out of Denmark and runs G Power. Again, um, uh, I look up to see Steen because um, he has similar sort of interests for me of, of based on LabVIEW and Test and He runs uh, a very successful business out of uh, Denmark in G Power. Uh, all of the uh, toolkits that he put out. I mean, so if you have ever have a, a look at the G Power toolkits, I mean, you can see the thought and the process that has gone into it. And we're very thankful to all of you. If I've missed anything, please do add to it. Uh, looks like no. So you guys are too modest. I mean, so <laughs> I would start asking my questions. I mean, so I have some topics that I've prepared. So my first thing would be like what Steve said before we started uh, was, I mean, a lot of people are afraid of making that leap from a nine to five employee to uh, to a consultant or, or running a business. I mean, so how do you think you can make that? I mean, what preparation do you need, think you need to make that leap? So, anyone wants to take this? I think it's just a leap. I think you just do it. Uh, I, mean, I know John and I talk a lot, and John's always talking about how hard it is, and, and it's hard. But like, if you wait until you have it figured out, you will never do it because there's just so much to learn and know, and you just kind of I I take like an agile approach, or, you know, agile from software development. Try something, see if it works. And keep iterating and you know stick with what works and keep adding to it that's my advice i think for me you know i mean there are different motivations the, the motive my main motivation was i was bored and i'm just terrible when i'm bored and so that was that was <laughs> it I, I i felt i was talking earlier i, I felt constrained by working in a factory because i knew all the machines in that factory and, and so actually starting out outside of that was um was really my main motivation and and, and, and I, what, whatever it has to be that motivation has to overcome the fear and I, to be quite honest with you um permanent employment they've chipped away at the benefits of being permanently employed so 
much that this transition <laughs> to actually working for yourself is not that big, you know. So that that was really for me. Yeah, for me it was. Uh, I was. Uh kind of a victim of circumstance. I, uh, I didn't, hadn't really considered starting a consultancy business. And, uh, you know, during the dot-com era of uh, the company I was at, Sun Microsystems was going through a lot of reductions in force and I got caught up in that. And uh, someone in the local LabVIEW community had some extra work and asked me if I wanted to come do that and hadn't even crossed my mind to go be a consultant. And uh, so I went and got my S corporation filed uh, I, I went and started doing the paperwork like the next day and I had an S corporation uh, instantiated within, you know, a couple of weeks. So, so that when he was ready to pay me, I had a way to, to accept payment. Uh, but yeah, I just, I just jumped in. I, I, I never really um, set out to, to start a business. It just kind of, kind of came my way and, and I've loved it ever since. It's, it's been a really exciting uh, journey. It's, it's a lot more exciting than than uh, sort of being an employee at, at the same old company for a long time because you get to get to do a lot a very wide variety of projects uh, you're constantly changing mm-hmm. gears so anyway that's how I got started I can add that um, that the leap from yeah employee to maybe consultant or, or one person company isn't that big it's, it's and not too dangerous i'd say especially the people that that probably think about doing that are, are quite proficient and then uh, you know well-balanced persons to have those thoughts so go ahead and do it uh, it, it might be quite a bigger leap to to start uh, adding on employees and and, and uh, at that point at that point, you you realize that you have some responsibilities that you suddenly are not just the master of yourself. You can't just leave that ship uh, because you you feel like it. Uh, as long as you're yourself, uh, you can change back. You can do a lot of different things. You have responsibilities for yourself, your family, obviously. But but um, that step isn't isn't too big. Uh, if people are thinking about doing that, have a go at it. it uh, it's it's not it's not dangerous. Um, and then maybe use that uh, as, uh, as 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 training or something like that to to try and have a business, try and see what new responsibilities uh, pops up. Uh, that maybe new uh, new things you need to do uh, tax wise and. Uh, stuff like that and when you have got that down and then start taking care of your own vacations your own pensions your own uh, you know um, uh, all the paperwork that you need to do insurance and stuff like that then you might be able to uh, to start tackling adding on employees if you'd like that that is that is a much bigger step uh, in my experience so, so I mean, from what it sounds like, I mean, a lot of you guys were naturally, you know, sort of going towards them. But for somebody who's planning to do this, I mean, so mm-hmm. who is uh, a methodical planned person, and uh, so if they have to do uh, a business plan and also have some funds in place so that uh, they can then they know that for the next six months or so i'm okay if i fail or not i mean but this is uh i mean a lot i mean we only see the successes in our community right but a lot of people do try and fail and so what would be your i don't know one or two sort of bullet points to consider before people uh, you know for people who are thinking about this seriously and not being forced into that situation if you like uh, yeah, uh, Srila, okay, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, so Sri, like, I'll uh, share a little bit of uh, how the insight, like, uh, how I got into, like, a consultancy job a little bit, and I'll, like, uh, you know, uh, pivot towards the second question. So for me, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, how I got from, like, uh, becoming an employee to now, like, uh, you know, uh, running a business is basically, like, uh, initially, I was, uh, you know, consulting for National Instruments itself in India. 
and that is where like uh, you know uh, i got exposed to like uh, many customers and i think this can be like a uh, one of the uh, insight on like uh, whether you want to move it because uh, slowly gradually as you moved uh, as an employee like uh, as you get exposed to many customers and now like you understand like you know how business is being done and then like you know what they're doing uh, towards and what the skill set you can offer that is how like as you know more and more people in the industry slowly like i think like that will provide you a little bit of you know uh, safety net also like uh, because you got the returning customers that is one point of uh, part and another thing is like uh, you know what we uh, call as the usp in business so unique selling point what you can deliver for example, like uh, as far as I know, like uh, Sam is always sharing. I actually love like, uh, you know, he joins, uh, he's like, uh, you know, uh, software engineering principles in LabVIEW plus his adventure for like, uh, you know, the rock climbing and everything. And similar to that one, like, uh, you know, while I was uh, like uh, starting out and everything at that time, I saw that like uh, there was a huge gap in the like a uh, skill set of LabVIEW in Indian industry. People were like a uh, developing application, like uh, they're sending in codes to the application engineering team and then you know <laughs> all the codes were like uh, you know the maps of the world okay so like uh, that is where i got this motivation and possibly i can make a difference and that is where like uh, my company called graphtex came into the play because like uh, there was a gap in the industry so uh, one of the unique selling point possibly like uh, you can have what i can deliver the value which is missing in the market i think that can be one of the thing and at the same time uh, you know, uh, as you move it, like uh, you can actually, uh, you know, develop uh, and then like slowly. I think like uh, we're in the pivot point. We're on the way, uh, maybe moving from Sam's place or the John's place and moving towards like a Steen because <laughs> we're also getting like a more and more like, uh, you know, uh, projects and like uh, it's not possible for me all to like uh, develop everything. But at the same time, you know, I need to hire people and uh, we got like a lot of developers in India. So that's where like, uh, you know, uh, I need to take like a more of a, a leadership role and then like, a, you know, paperwork, negotiations and all that kind of stuff is going to pile up. So I think like uh, people who want to, you know, want to join, jump from like, a, you know, uh, from becoming the employee where it is like, a, you know, the a safe place. Okay, let's say like I'm going to get the salary every month. And that is where Steve was also saying that like, a, you know, becoming an employee was like as much as risk as becoming a full time employee or a freelancer. So that is where like, uh, yeah. yeah. So you're saying that identify the gap in the market before you do uh, yes. and, you know, yeah. take that leap. I mean, so yeah. in your case, you found that training was one of the gaps and then, you, you know, but um, so one thing that I would um, uh, sort of ask is, I mean, so uh, if you do make that leap and then you find that there are projects coming in and um, so like Steen said, I mean, maybe hiring the first person. So this really terrifies me to be responsible for another person. Um, so, uh, and if for whatever reason, your projects stop coming and how do you, uh, have you been in that situation, first of all? And secondly, I mean, so do you ever worry about it? And what can you tell people, um, you know, from, from what your experience has been? Uh, yeah. Learn uh, how to save. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I cut you off from. You go. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll try to like uh, be as brief as possible so that like we can have diverse uh, yeah. input into this this one. So basically, like in my context, like uh, uh, since like I have trained like a lot of people in the past, most of them were engineers. I think ninety five percent were engineers and five percent was a scientist from government organization and other R and D uh, companies and like a very few numbers were students. So what actually happened is like because of possibly like I had this kind of network, like, you know, although these guys were like a good in developing applications or something like they might have larger projects, which their team are incapable of, uh, you know, fulfilling them so that they would reach out to us. And then like uh, uh, for us, like uh, there's not uh, much of an issue, but like uh, sometimes what actually happens is like uh, I'll very, very honest, like uh, at least in India is still like a. Uh, I, I can tell you like a 95% to 96% of the lab developers, they are like a very bad with like a following like a what Sam wants to, you know, instill. And then like, a, you know, people don't even know like about object oriented programming is still there in lab view. So like, this is one of the things. So whenever we get the projects from outside, let's say like a, from US or like a offshore projects, in that case, it's like, a, you know, it's very difficult to find the people. 
although like uh, we can have a lab view developers but like uh, it's still difficult to find the people who can actually deliver projects using like uh, oops or like uh, you know the actor framework so in that case uh, yeah so like uh, your kind of like the scenario what you are asking it a little bit terrifies but at the same time because uh, i have uh, you know the background of training people so that is where i try to nurture them so that like you know slowly prepare and then you know uh, mentoring them to handle that project yeah. okay so uh, so from what i know steen and john has made that leap of adding employees to your organization so do you guys have anything to add yeah definitely um one, I have a lot of people approach me at user group meetings asking me, you know, how can I get started doing this? And one of the first things I ask them is, do you have McDonald's wrappers in the back of your car? <laughs> uh, do you mow your lawn every week? Uh, do you shovel your snow? And believe me, I've seen Sam's car and I asked him that, those questions when he first wanted to get started. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot there's a lot more to a lab view business than writing lab view code and everybody uh, I've seen a lot of the comments everybody says oh all you need is a laptop and a, and a lab view license and you know that's a great way to get started but there's a lot more to it than that and um, you, you've got to build out your infrastructure and I'd like to talk about that on another question if possible but uh, before that you've got to you know you got to get your business instantiated with the local uh, state and federal governments and you've got to be able to um, you know, fill out all the forms quarterly and annually. You, you might want to talk to a lawyer. You might want to hire an accountant. Um, eventually, if you do hire employees, you have to do payroll. Uh, you're going to need some financial software. You're going to need to collect those hours from your employees to bill them through to your customer unless you're doing fixed price bids. Even then, you're probably going to want to know how much your employees are working. So if you're not a detail-oriented person, uh, this might not be the business for you. There's a lot of extra work that goes into it above and beyond being a good lab view coder. Um, the infrastructure can be can be really daunting. And like I said, I'm hoping there's a question down uh, further into this presentation about infrastructure, but uh, yeah, just getting the business started and keeping the, the uh, forms uh, filed and, and, you know, keeping your business legit is, is uh, a lot more work than you might think it than you might think it is, and then hiring employees. Once you get employees, you're, you might want to offer them benefits. You might want to give them four hundred one k plans. You might want to give them uh, medical insurance. So it it can get a lot more complicated than you think. If you're just a one man band, you know you're not going to have to worry too much about that stuff. But as soon as you start adding employees, it gets a lot more complicated. Yeah, I think um, the, the thing that I'm kind of missing in this conversation is 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 know yourself. Um, I think the comment came up. It's sort of said, if it's not for you, it's it's not for you. It's not a bad thing. It's it's but there are a particular type of person that that does it, and there are different motivations. And and the motivation really to to get do this kind of thing could be like me, boredom, and I, I want to do build things in different places. Of different types of things, you know, and I, and I like that lack of discipline in, in the work, and I like. And the other thing for me is freedom. Uh, so I don't want to employ people. Um, so my business is a partnership because I don't. I want my partners to be the same, have the same motivations as me. So, and because I, I don't like management. So I don't. My business will stay the size it is, um, and 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 that's fine because it's my business. You know, that's that's the beauty of being in business you yourself. You can you can make your business a reflection of you. There's nothing to say that you have to have growth all the time and all of this. You just need to make a decent living, you know, and that's adequate. Uh, certainly is for me anyway. I mean, as long as I get a variety of things to build that are interesting, then, then I'm a happy bunny. So, you know, there's, there's, there's routes you can go and it suits your type of personality. Um, and that's the beauty of it. But know thyself, you know, really just know yourself and know what you want from it. So, so do you, did you ever consider uh, adding employees to your business or were you basically saying, OK, well, we'll do with contractors when we, we have extra work and uh, um, or is it not something that you've considered? Yes, I have had contractors uh, and I have and we just 
it's just you end up maintaining a lot more of other people's software than you would like. Um, so it was uh, it was really what it does. One of my motivations, or one of my worries when I started in business uh, would be at some point in time, I'd have so much software out there, because you can be quite productive in that, that I would spend all my time maintaining all this code that I generated, and, uh, and which is why I apply a lot of the disciplines I do to the, the way I write my software, is because I don't want to be doing that. I mean, and again, there's a perfectly good business case to do that, if that's what you want to do. I mean, so, uh, so this is... Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, this is another question, isn't it? I mean, so when, when you are an engineer, I mean, you're always innovating and you're adding features and there's feature creep and things like that. As a business owner, you can't afford to do that. I mean, because that's your time wasted, right? I mean, so how do you put that kind of ring fence around you to make sure that you're not, one, being an engineer exploring and adding things to your, I mean, to the software that you're providing to somebody. I mean, so how do you maintain that discipline? I mean, are there any tools or things that you do? I mean, spreadsheets where you say, okay, yeah, uh, that, okay, this has gone too far, or even control your employees from, you know, sort of drifting onto that path. I mean, because we're all engineers at the end of the day. So uh, I mean, uh, know your was, efficiency and know your hourly rate. That was, that was my two things I'll shout out now. <laughs> so I, this kind of touches on some of the infrastructure stuff for me anyway. Um, I use a bug tracker to do, to do project management. And the way I keep engineers on track is, uh, you know, at our, at our peak, we had um, six employees and three subcontractors, and they were spread across at least half a dozen projects, probably more like a dozen projects. Uh, and not full time on each one, so they they might bounce around between projects. And you know the way we managed that was with our bug tracker. We would we would um, you know assign people into groups in the bug tracker and assign them on sprints. And uh, you know they might not be full time on a sprint, but they might be uh, doing two or three sprints at the same time across different customers across different projects. That can get really tricky to manage in a spreadsheet. I wouldn't recommend doing it in a spreadsheet. I'd recommend a bug tracker at the very least. Uh, the bug tracker we use has a Gantt chart, which, which tends to get into the realm of project management. Um, so that's kind of how, you know, the, the mechanism we use. Uh, the bug tracker is, is a real central part of the way we do business. So the, an issue tracker such as Jira or uh, or something similar to 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 make sure that you have um, an idea of what's happening. So uh, the next question really is how do you? I mean, do you guys cold call people to get more business in? I mean, and uh, as again as an engineer, I think I, I quote Steve again here where he say we're all introverts as engineers, and for us to be uh, people who don't have that inhibition to talk to people about, you know, especially money and stuff. I mean, and so how do we, how do you approach that? I mean, do, first thing is, do you cold call? And how do we get past that inhibition? Because right now you're playing the role of an engineer and an entrepreneur, an account manager and everything else. So. So cold calling works. Unfortunately, it, it does. But you need to, work. warm calling is better. So that's no, so if you do a job for, I don't know, a car maker solving a particular problem, there's quite a lot of other car makers that have that same problem. So look at what jobs you've done, look at potential clients and ring them up. That's called warm calling, which is, is a lot better because you've got a success. You can say, ah, I did it this way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very keen on that type of, and it works. It's just horrible, you know, because <laughs> we're not used to doing it, but it works. Uh, and, it, you know, you can market to your blue in the face, you know, and make as many, you know, all my years of writing blog posts, I've gotten zero business from that. All my presentations at CLA Summit, zero business to that, because essentially I'm, I'm marketing to the wrong people. Whereas cold calling, you're saying, I did this job for someone, they paid me. There must be other people out in the world who would pay me. So you've already got a conversation point going. So you just need to find them then, and that's just research. LinkedIn's great for that. Um, so yeah, but it's it's you know it, the other thing 
The other thing I found recently is you find a business development manager for another company and get him to do the hard work if you're a small company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that worked really well. I like so that. Hiring somebody part time, I mean, uh, to to do your cold calling, I mean, uh, so that kind of works for you. Well, I mean. Again, if you're if you're a small company, you can go to a like. If, so if a company is is essentially their main job is making, I don't know, test systems, the the wiring of it, and they're a much bigger company to you. Well, you could go to them and say, well, look, you could add software to your business here, and think think how much better that would be. You know, do you want to partner up? And usually those those companies have dedicated business development people that, that will then go out and sell your stuff. But you have to make it uh, you have to make it so that people make money out of you. But if you can convince people to make money out of you, you're in you're on to a winner, you know. It's, it's it's life is easy. If if you don't like the selling, if you like the selling, go sell, you know. Yeah. Um, but there are alternatives. Um, so um so when, when, when you do do that, I mean, and you get some customers, I mean, there are, I mean, I, I worked in companies where they don't, uh, or, or their supply chain uh, or supply terms are like, I mean, six months after delivery, I mean, payments after six months of delivery. I mean, how do you deal with customers who essentially are too big, where they can almost bully you? I mean, so to say that, okay, these are our ter payment terms. I mean, so you complete the project and then we get, give you, I mean, pay you after six months or so. Do you have any with some? Luckily, my wife. Luckily, my wife works in credit and collections for a big company like that. So when I have problems, uh, she helps me get paid. I gotta say, in my 17 years, I've only had one inc incident where a customer actually didn't follow through on a payment. Um, but in terms of negotiating terms, net 30, net 60, net 90, yeah, it's David and Goliath. You don't have a lot of leverage. Some companies are like, that's our policy and, and take it or leave it. Uh, so yeah, you've got to, um, you know, as, as many of the people have said in the comments here, you've got to, you got to have some savings. You've got to be able to, you know, be able to get out there for a year or two and not count on a steady income or count on getting paid three months after you've done the work best case one month after you've done the work uh so uh it, it is it is sort of a david and goliath situation you really don't have a lot of leverage to change those big companies terms and and, and your payment I mean, terms. It, I mean, like Steve said, you could probably sack somebody if, um, I mean, you've got plenty of work. I mean, but if you don't have that luxury and you are dependent on such a big company, I mean, so you, um, and say, for example, you have to buy hardware for 200K or whatever uh, for, for them to pay you 500K later on. So, so do you generally approach banks with some orders to, so that they can, you can sort of fund that purchase initially before um no and uh, so always the customer I don't, pay. I don't pay in 30 days we don't do business with them if they if they want us to buy hardware and they don't pay generally they have to they have to pay, buy up front and i just just don't put yourself under that sort of risk and pressure if you're unhappy about it you know you don't have to do business with everyone it's it's and and quite often they come back Quite often, if you if you stand strong and say no, that's no, this is not acceptable. Um, you know those because because you've got an intellectual cudgel to beat them with. Generally, they're coming to you because you're the brain that the, the, they're, they're after. You know, so you know, just stand stand firm. I know, and if you can't, if you're already in there, well, then plan to get out. I mean, it took me my my first customer used to treat me terribly and but it took me a year to get out but that was always a plan is you plan to not have those customers and you know over the years i've surrounded myself by nice customers who pay me on time and want to help me and and it makes life so much nicer well and when it comes to hardware um you know that kind of gets into the what, what kind of a business are you trying to to establish you know if you're going to be a, a reseller for ni and you plan on selling a lot of hardware, that's a lot different than just doing software consultancy. Uh, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're similar businesses and there's a lot of overlap, but there's different headaches that come along with, with uh, 
you know, the turnkey systems integration stuff. We tend to focus just on software. If customers want hardware, we might make recommendations, but we don't, we're not a reseller, not yet anyway. We might be on our next project, but um, for now, we don't resell any NI hardware or any key site hardware. Uh, we simply consult on software. It's a much easier business to run without all the hardware headaches. So, uh, so what, what, once you, you do uh, do that, I mean, and once you make your niche in, in, in the market, I mean, so I mean, one is to, to appear visible. And then, uh, so like, even though Steve said that none of my CLA presentations have earned me any customers, but you are visible, right? I mean, so uh, you make a presentation. I mean, so for example, Steam puts out G Power Toolkit. So, um, and so what other marketing strategy do you use to, to make yourself visible? I mean, so say in Denmark, for example, for you to attract a customer, what else do you do? I mean, do you go to trade fairs? I mean, do you sort of advertise somewhere? Well, it's a, it's a, um, Denmark is a, is, is a bit special, uh, not, not to, to every, place else in the world but uh, and I used to have a, a very large presence regionally here uh, which they have withdrawn for a number of a number of years ago so currently it's, it's quite uh, dead water here for for NI there is no regional office there is no regional presence um, the nearest NI support is a number of countries away so um so the customers here in denmark are more or less left to themselves uh, and they if they know somebody that are working uh, at g power or some of the the others uh, the other uh, integrators here or the other partners here they contact uh, us or some of the other guys and um but else they'll just look at ni.com or uh, maybe call up one of the phone numbers and and get somebody in a, in a sort of different country. So, uh, marketing or branding yourself as an NI partner has become increasingly hard in Denmark, and in in, in many other places of the world where NI has withdrawn their presence a lot. So um, that is that is one thing that probably uh, puts. Uh, the business of, of LabVIEW and TestAnd and NI, uh, apart from just the general business as maybe a contractor or a freelancer or a programmer or, or what are you, uh, that is something that, that uh, I have I've discovered over the years that relying on NI as the ecosystem or the, or the backing infrastructure of a company is difficult. Um, more than perhaps relying on I don't know Microsoft or, or somebody else like that. It could have been different in, in uh, back in the day with Microsoft, and it might be different in the future as well. Currently, NI as as the sole foundation of a company is very difficult. Consider that carefully if uh, if uh, if you want to go this way. But then again, there is also a difference of scale of of companies, and that is something that that is worth considering when when growing a business if you, if you want to do that uh, i have my own reasons for why gpar is is more than myself and more than maybe two or three people today we are about around 15 people uh, so th th there are reasons for that and um, we can get to those if 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 it's uh, if it's relevant uh, in a while but yeah. but uh, attracting customers for us where we are now is mostly about inbound uh, inbound marketing uh, based on cases and our network. Um, so cold calling, as we discussed uh, a minute ago, well, yeah, that works. But if you have the time, if you have the, the manpower, the bandwidth to, to do warm calling, actually to, to put your opportunities and your potential customers through the funnel and, and only talk to the people that have a, a good a, a good chance of actually becoming your customers. That's time much better spent. If you see yourself spending time cold calling, that's mm -hmm. a risk. Uh, it's a real risk. It's, it's, a, it's an energy drain on yourself. It's an energy drain on uh, your customers or, or the people you call. 
yes, you will probably get some work from that. It might not be the best work, uh, and it might be a dead end. So uh, it's hard to build on top of, of the customers that you found that way. Uh, finding and following the hot leads and, and managing those, getting more business from, from the customers that you already know uh, is, is a much better, uh, much better fit for new customers. And so then it will be, uh, yeah. yeah. Go for it, sorry. So yeah, but then it will be, um, um, you know, it will build on, on, on top of, uh, on top of itself. Uh, successful projects that you did will uh, draw in new products, uh, projects uh, and new customers. Um, but once you reach, uh, well, there is, there is probably a, 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 a step somewhere where, uh, at least in my experience, where we, ch we change from uh, an economy that is comparable to a, a personal economy and to some place where it definitely wasn't a personal economy anymore, where it's, it's a business economy. Mm -hmm. uh, those Managing those two scenarios are very different. When it's yourself or maybe just a couple of people, you can more or less manage dips in, in, in finances and budgets. And, you know, if you don't get paid, you can more or less manage that with your own savings uh, by putting some money into the company and taking them out again when you're more successful, you have some business. Uh, at some point, uh, that's not going to do it anymore. <clears throat> at the moment, my personal uh, my personal finances wouldn't run this company for a single month. Uh, <laughs> so, so that won't work <laughs> at that scale. So uh, scale the company once your processes are uh, ready for it. Uh, don't add on people before you have their yeah, processes put in place that manages your risk, your contracts. Uh, you have some uh, descriptions of your roles. You have some ideas of who your customers are, how you get new customers, how you communicate your, your messages and so on. Who does your website? Who does your IT? Who does your security? Who sets up new computers? Uh, who, uh, who was speaking with an eye? and your other partners and uh, all that stuff. And today managing customers, new customers, uh, I have people helping me, me with that, but I'm still uh, also a part of it. Um, and if, if you're growing a company to maybe four, five or six people, uh, you'll probably find yourself being much more of an administrator and salesperson than a lab programmer running that company. Um, so, and once you get to maybe where we are now, or maybe, I don't know, about maybe about 10 people or so, uh, you, you start to be able to divide that work out onto more people. And then you can start being the, the technician again, if that's what you want. So, uh, so the, the the thing I'm hearing is that I mean, so making the leap from a consultant to a com uh, uh, sorry from an employee to a consultant is fairly easy, but when you want to grow, you want to make sure your processes are in place. You have finances that can support the extra employees or uh, or means to support that, um, and also you should have an established customer base where the work is coming in. Uh, without you having to work extra hard to find those extra things. I mean, new customers will be more welcome, but I mean, you have an established base and you also then say you have a defined role in the company and then you identify all your partners as such. So one of the questions that keeps coming up is, um, uh, is how do you hire the right talent? Right. I mean, so whether you go contracting, whether you go for an experienced person or a graduate. Um, so Sam puts his hand up. I mean, so I'd like to. You said from... talent. Don't hire talent. Hire good people. Okay. Train them for the things that you need them to do. That's my so advice right there. Okay. So you're saying people with the right attitude to learning, and that's what you need. Right? Yep. People okay. who are willing to learn and who you get along with. Those two things right there. Everything else will work itself out. 
Okay. So. Um, totally agree. So, so do you uh, do you have a strategy to to learn? I mean, either hire graduates and then train them up, or whether uh, do you go for experienced people? I mean, as a general rule. So in in Colorado, um, there's a lot of what I would call one man band. LabVIEW consultancies, or there were at one point, they've really kind of diminished in the last like five years. Uh, so rather than hiring, I, I did have a, a handful or more of employees at one point, and they were all, they all had some skill in LabVIEW, but they had other skills too, like Embedded C uh, or MATLAB or something like that. Um, but when it comes to finding LabVIEW people, Colorado has always been a really easy place to go find a subcontractor. I don't know if that's true in other geographical areas. I think it's probably true in Texas and California. I'm not sure about the UK. That's a really good way to, to get somebody on a project, but not employ them and not be responsible for their payroll. It, it, it puts you in a situation where you need a guy for, you know, a few months but he's kind of responsible for his own business. I've, I've done that many times and it works really well. Um, bringing on employees is a, is a different story. And what I look for there is absolutely, as Sam said, good people, but I also need to match skills to, to my customer. You know, I definitely have people that are targeting specific things like MATLAB, for instance, not, not all the time and, and uh, just as an off the cuff example or Python or Java or whatever, you know, the, the task is at hand. And if you don't have employees that already have that skill, then you either need to go find one or you need to get a subcontractor temporarily to help you out with that. Okay, so uh, another question that's on the floor, uh, chat is, I mean, how do you become an NI partner? I mean, so do you guys, have any input on that? I know everybody's smiling. I know for what reason, but I'd like to hear from you guys. <laughs> the partnership program has changed a lot over the 17 years I've been a, a part uh, uh, a partner. I actually haven't been a partner that long. It's been about 14 years. Um, you definitely have to have some certifications. You know, they're, they're going to require that you have a CLA on board or a CTA or whatever. Um, then they're going to want to get into, are you a reseller or, or, you know, what type of partner are you? And that has also changed over the years. You're probably, uh, I think I needed a sponsor at one point just to get started. And then you have to pay your, your uh, partnership fee, but that gets you your lab view license. You know, it's not a purchase, it's a lease and you have to pay it every year, but you get all the toolkits, you get test stand and, you know, FPGA, all, all that stuff. So that's a that's a great way to get the software, at, but it, it, it is an annual cost and you've got to have some certifications in place to get started. Um, beyond that, uh, and I apologize, NI, but um, I wouldn't expect a lot more from the partnership than that. They're, they're not, you're not going to get fed a lot of business leads. Um, you're on your own for running your business and you're on your own for getting your customers and getting your leads and stuff. The partnership is a, uh, is, um, you know, don't, I wouldn't set my expectations too high on, on once you get that partnership. Okay. It's a, it's a misconception I had when I joined uh, 2001, I think I became an alliance partner. And for, for many years, I, I, I sat there frustrated that I wasn't being given all the leads that the sales guys had, were keeping to themselves until I discovered that actually the sales guys didn't have any leads to give. Uh, it's just not set up for that. It's not in their interests. It's they 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 have no benefit. It's they're they're not judged upon it. Nobody in NI will will be given congratulations for making your business a success. Um, I'm, you know, it's not, so the term partnership but at the moment is is reasonably loose. It could be better. Uh, it could be a partnership, and it could be quite powerful as a partnership. Uh, this is what I'm hoping for in the future, but you know these things happen slowly. It's a big, it's a big company, you know. Um, but really, the best way for you to become an alliance partner is is for you to have something that NI want from an alliance partner. Uh, so you, you're not, they're not going to make you an alliance partner just just because you're great, you know. 
<laughs> it's it's really they they would have to be either on the lookout for alliance partners in your area uh, they have to you have to sell something that has their hardware in it or they want your, to put their hardware in it you know you have to have something to give them and say look if i was an alliance partner we could do great things and that discussion has to be uh that way round because you know you can you can ask for it and expect it but it's it's up to them how many partners they have um you know and, and sometimes they just say we've we've got enough uh, and then sometimes they'll say we won't need loads more so in all those internal machinations you're not aware of <laughs> so it gets quite frustrating but um it's 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 generally you know yeah. it's, it's it's not a given so i can one see one of the, yeah. one of the ways that the the partner program has changed a lot um, recently, and and that change has been gradual over the last ten years, but it has changed a lot over the last maybe three years. Uh, is is the change from uh, the partners being good representatives of NI, and um, yeah, that was that was when certifications and uh, yeah stuff like that uh, actually meant a lot uh, now and i is, is is growing up it's, it's changing to become a much bigger company and so they are focused on solutions so if you can contribute with solutions uh, in some areas that and i is focusing on uh, then then you're probably at a, a, a company or person that that could be an ni partner uh, they have changed a lot of how they view their customers. And so so some customers are managed or handled by distributors and some of their customers are, that, that makes a good fit for their current uh, business uh, business model, uh, are still handled directly by NI. And that change has also um, been driven a lot by, uh, by solutions in, in the proper markets. Um, so um so today i th i think it would would be i have no idea how you how you become a partner today if you if you are one person so so no right idea. now the, yeah the business model of ni has changed and to become a partner as a single person is difficult but it, i it think is it was yes yeah uh, so one of the questions that comes up on the forums and uh, also in this chat is i don't know who my field service engineer is so if you don't know and you're already a partner uh, so there is a partner only forum on uh, ni.com uh, steen is smiling but uh, so if you need to be added to that i mean it does get some more attention than the general forum if you're not aware of whom to contact, I mean, so contact one of us and then we'll give you the contact person of, uh, at NI to do this. Um, so, uh, so my next question would be, I mean, so when you put a training plan for a, uh, a person, I mean, so you invest in an employee and that person sort of, um, one, maybe not turn out to be as good as you thought, a person was. I mean, so your investment is gone, or he or she leaves after a year or so. I mean, so how 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 can you make some? I mean, so this is where the experience against training comes into picture, right? I mean, so how do you weigh this? I mean, as a because as a small business, it's a big risk for you. I would thought. It, it's it's a big risk for any size business. I think mm -hmm. uh, investing in people is necessary, uh, and and. You should always do that. Uh, yeah. uh, if if you don't and they stay, what then? <laughs> so uh, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I've seen that meme. Uh, but yeah, um, so. but it's, it's it's very true. And and if you if you do as as Sam suggested, uh, you know, find the right people, then well, it it might be a good fit. They might learn lab you, or they might be a good fit anyways for 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 your company for some role there. Uh, sure, if you need lab your programmers, they it, it doesn't uh, make good sense so, if, if if you don't have lab your programmers. But uh, yeah, but if you I mean, it's, it's, yeah, sorry. it's a leaky bucket, isn't it? I mean, you you need to you need to keep filling out the bucket, <laughs> um, 
and everyone needs to do that because at some point you're going to want to drink from it and, and so it doesn't yeah. matter if you train them and leave because presumably you'll then go to want to replace them with somebody who's trained and then you know if, if nobody's doing any training for fear of them leaving then that bucket will go a bit dry won't it so, so uh, i mean one, one one question is i mean so if you what we're approached by a customer and then they say, I need a test solution. How do you convince them to say, okay, you need to uh, take LabVIEW or test them on and not Python, which is free, for, I mean, as far as they're concerned. I mean, so what, I mean, because initially, I mean, you know, when maybe 10 years ago, it was easy to sort of show the difference that, okay, C or C++ takes that much more longer. With the introduction of Python, it takes, it's not that much more of a, a bridge, if you like, I mean, between solutions based on Python and LabVIEW. I mean, so how do you, I mean, one, keep it to be an NI basis system or, or, or a business, or do you uh, sort of accept that change and then add Python as one of the tool thing, tools that you provide solutions for? Um, I, I like to approach it sort of as a, as a total cost of ownership type of idea. Um, you know, you can program any solution in any language within reason. Um, so it, which language you pick doesn't really dictate uh, the cost or the technical benefits of, of uh, your solution. Uh, LabVIEW has been traditionally great at instrumentation and test and measurement. And that's the way I always position it. But I've definitely had people come back and say, I'll just hire a uh, college student and write it all in Python. Well, good luck. You know, call me back in 12 months, uh, you know, because I'll, I'll do it in test stand a lot faster than that, test stand and lab view. Um, and then not only have they, uh, not only have they not scoped the problem and the total cost of ownership properly, they may have even put themselves in technical debt that they may have to, to dig out of later because they hired, uh, you know, they thought I can just get a college student that knows Python and then they end up with spaghetti code in a different language that still has to be fixed. So I, I don't know, I, that's the way I approach it, total cost of ownership. I, I don't really understand why the go-to skill that is, everyone talks about this, the go-to, we've talked about it at length, the go-to skill for a LabVIEW programmer if they can't find LabVIEW work is Python. Just seems to me to be a bizarre thing. So I'm going to I'm going to leave this language for developing systems and go and try and learn a language that all the kids are learning. Is that really who you want to be competing with? Do you really want to be competing with low-wage kids uh, going to join the uh, university on Udemy for learning Python? I don't think I want to play that game. I, you'd be much better off learning Fortran if you can't answer you and go and find some jobs or small talk or something and go and find a job that's got that it's a rare skill. You know, I, I just don't understand it. I, I think think about complementary skills, don't think about replacement skills. So if, if if LabVIEW can do a certain amount of things, well, find something that's complementary that allows you to do more. You know, find, you know so, do PLC programming, learn Linux, do databases. I don't know, but find a complementary skill you can add on and build around your current toolbox. Don't say, oh, well, this spanner's a bit, a bit crap. I'm going to go and buy another spanner. It, it's just, you know, it, it just seems strange to me. It's just a bizarre kind of. I mean, the thing is, I hear it. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, you offer a customer solution, and then they go, okay, we need to add features to this, and we will be doing further development on this software that you provide. But then, if it was LabVIEW, they have to buy three or four licenses, whereas Python, they don't have to, right? I mean, so that's one argument that comes through. And then, and I right now, almost all of the drivers now have Python support, you know, so and so that makes it. I mean, before it was like, yeah, it's plug and play with hardware, with LabVIEW, more or less, right? So that bridge is closing, and uh, and it makes it harder to justify, you know, sort of sticking to the LabVIEW costs for for the customers, at least. It isn't, it isn't that was a hardware problem. driver. That's, that's not why I use LabVIEW. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for you, yeah, I mean, yeah, for you, it is the way of thinking, right? I mean, it is how you express I mean, from your presentations. I understand that. Um, yeah. But for most people, right. or at least how NI market it is like, you know, yeah, 
have three nodes and there's hardware, and he's you streaming 100 megabytes of data per second, right? So mm. that, <laughs> might be their, that might be their marketing and not and not <laughs> actually the the real world of lab view programming. It might be, yeah. they might be separate things. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the hour has passed by and I have a lot more questions to ask uh, ask you guys. But before we leave, Mayana, do you have one comment each from each of you before Mayana, for, for people who are thinking about starting their own business? Uh, let's start with Sam. Uh, nobody really mentioned mentorship, but I think no. that's huge. So go find yourself a mentor. I am sure I will gladly help you out. And if anybody here, I'm sure will. And Fab, I think, is into that too. So, you know, if you're having trouble, reach out to somebody and ask around. So that's my advice. Okay, John. Uh, it's a really exciting thing to do. There's lots of different projects, medical, renewable energy, aerospace. They're, you're all over the place, and it's a lot of fun. It's very challenging mentally, so be up for the task, um, build out an infrastructure, build out a good bug tracker and, and revision control and, and accounting and get it, get an infra infrastructure in place. Steve? I've not regretted it for a second, even when the, the highs are much higher, the lows are clearer. You know, there's nothing, nothing worse than being stressed out by an idiot manager. You don't get that, you get Customers, of course, but you don't get managers. <laughs> Ram? Uh, yeah, I would, I would say that, like, uh, you know, there is a philosophy some of uh, us has said that, you know, uh, you are in a ship or something. So basically, if you are an employee, then, like, uh, you are in a ship, like, uh, it's going to its own destination. You have been taken somewhere else. So I think, like, uh, Steve's uh, words also, like, uh, a little bit echoes over here. So basically, what I said is, like, uh, while you are in a ship, for a time being, you have to learn to build your own boat so that like you test it out on the side. So when you are safe enough, like you can like, you know, hop onto your boat or submarine, whatever you want to say. And then like you can go towards your own destination. I think like, and that is where like I want to connect towards like a Sam's as well as like a John's also, for example, like a little bit of business, like a management skills. And then, you know, paperwork, paperwork will pile up very quickly. And then like a Sam was saying that like, you know, mentors, if you, will certainly need that yeah steam yeah i, I agree uh, that uh, you should probably realize that you need more skills than you have you people considering this and and working with with labview in the first place which is very hardware engineer you're probably quite proficient software engineer and hardware engineer somewhere around that but you need some business skills as well and you need some confidence in yourself the best way is to talk with people who have tried it, and this does then just go for it. Uh, it's it's quite risk free to to do it yourself. Uh, just being yourself, right? One person. Uh, so try that out, uh, and then talk to people. This community is is uh, great at sharing experiences, uh, also about uh, about business and being consultant and, and a freelancer and so on and if you are considering uh, becoming a larger corporation then team up with somebody who has some experience with that um, and again speak with the community about it um, don't don't be alone don't stay alone about this yeah i mean one thing i would add is that many so i i seem to remember uh, fabiola writing about uh, uh, a fund uh, with some prefix on it. I mean, I'm not going to repeat that, but uh, but basically, I I, I would uh, definitely say that. I mean, you need to say for uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there you go. It's on the chat, um, and uh, that was a good read for me. I mean, I don't know if there is a. Uh, I'm sure I read somewhere. I mean, but if there is a link, please do post it, Fab. And uh, and uh, yeah, like uh, Steen said, I mean, we're all approachable. I mean, so please do reach out. I mean, the community is great in helping each other. And uh, uh, I'd like to thank all my five panelists. And um, sorry, uh, I couldn't get all the questions in, but uh, hopefully this was useful. Thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.